Welcome to ForensicWeek.com. I am your host, Tom Moriello, coming to you from Laurel, Maryland, CEO of Forensic IQ Incorporated and professor at the University of Maryland Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice. This evening, this is episode 24. You're probably wondering where we were last week, but several things. One, the fact that I lost my voice and also the fact that my entire staff was in the middle of finals and getting ready for graduation. So... Uh, we found it in the best interest of everybody um, to not do a show last week. So I know I know you missed us, but remember, you always have all the other episodes that you didn't get to see. But as I said, this evening is episode 24, and it's entitled The Dollhouse Murders, a CSI Learning Tool, presented by ForensicWeek.com staff, discussing the book, The Dollhouse Murders, written by yours truly, uh, in the six crime scene dioramas associated with the book used to teach criminal justice students at the University of Maryland and also police officers that I train from various uh, police academies. And what we train them in is on the steps uh, uh, that are necessary to preserve and protect crime scenes and physical evidence contained within them. ForensicWeek.com is a talk show presented live on your desktop every Thursday evening. So if this is your first time, Make sure it's not your last. We're here every Thursday evening from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on www.forensicweek.com featuring real forensic science by real forensic scientists and real forensic science educators. We are proud members of the Hangout10.com live TV network, which is a series of shows like this one recorded and broadcast live using Google+. Besides our special topic, we always broadcast our Forensic IQ Update Report, presented live by one of my student interns from the University of Maryland, who will keep you up on current issues, events, and training that are out there that are important to the uh, forensic community. The forensic interns working on the show this semester, well, the old student intern that used to work for ForensicWeek.com, our producer Tim Fromm, is no longer a student because on Sunday Tim graduated. But the good thing is even though he graduated, and even though he's not a student anymore, Tim Fromm will continue to be the producer of ForensicWeek.com, and I appreciate that. Uh, so uh, congratulations, uh, Tim, on graduating. Thank and you. Got to meet your family, everything. And we also have Mark Lombard still around. Mark is a junior, so he has another year, and he will be continuing for a while until we can get some other student interns to, uh, to be involved in Forensic IQ Update Report. So, Mark, again, thank you for continuing for a while. Andrea Williams, some of you have, uh, saw her on a few occasions. Uh, she graduated. She's immediately going to grad school at Stevenson University, so uh, we wish her uh, well. Um, by the way, this morning at the University of Maryland, American Systems, which is that company that we've been talking to, to you about for the last several shows, that are trying, not trying, who are in the process of hiring 150 trainees in latent print uh, technology and examination. Uh, they have a, con a government contract to provide forensic services, uh, I believe, to the DOD. Uh, and they're looking for uh, young people that they can provide the training and, and skills, etc. Um, as you might know, we invited them at the University of Maryland. They came here today with their HR people and several of the forensic uh, uh, experts who um, uh, these 150 uh, uh, student workers will be working for. They talked about the program, how to apply. Um, we had about 30 students who came, not only from the University of Maryland, but also uh, Dr. Uh, Jay Tobin from Stevenson University also got some of his graduate forensic students to come also. So really excited about this. As I've said before, excuse me, <coughs> that this is the first time in my 35 years of teaching that 
I saw it, uh, that I've seen an opportunity like this, um, where they're looking to find young folks who have just graduated, who are looking to get into the community in some aspect of law enforcement or forensics. Not sure. A lot of them, interestingly enough, want to get into some aspect of investigations, but they don't want to be police officers per se. Or they're criminal justice majors, they would like to get into forensics, but they don't have all that science background that most science positions need. But Leighton Prince, a little bit different than that, although a lot of them do have chemistry and biology backgrounds, and it is not required. So our criminal justice students have a great opportunity. So um, those of you who might be listening, if you are in that position, uh, please look up American Systems. In, uh, if you haven't done this already, uh, Tim, please uh, put up that URL for, uh, for that job uh, so uh, the, the uh, viewers can uh, uh, do that on their own. You can, you can fill out an application online, send your resume, and I strongly suggest uh, that you consider that. Okay, let's get into our, our general discussion for this evening. Uh, the following uh, uh, is about something that happened way back in 1980. 1980, I developed the course that I teach called CCJS 320, Introduction to Criminalistics. And when I was teaching this course, teaching students how to process crime scenes, how to look for forensic evidence, how to analyze forensic evidence, in order to give them an opportunity to have a real life uh, experience, I actually had a house on Knox Road in College Park, a fully furnished house owned by the university that I was able to use every semester. And I would create a scenario and would, we would put all the evidence in there that was consistent with the scenario. And I'd have my class going through this house and, and analyzing evidence. It was, it was a great, great thing. But uh, unfortunately, because the university was growing and they needed uh, more dormitories, they knocked down the house to build high-rise dormitories, and I lost that opportunity. In 1992, uh, I found an alternative. Um, I was at the Maryland uh, office of the chief medical examiner's office in Baltimore, and I saw some training tools that they had called the nutshell uh, crimes. These nutshell crimes, and there were actually 18 of them, right, were dollhouses they were of crime scenes. They were created back in, 19, in the 1940s by an eccentric millionaire who founded the Harvard University Department of Legal Medicine. Her name was Frances uh, Glessner Lee. Uh, she uh, built these dollhouses because that was her interest, and she was also obviously a, a professor of legal medicine, uh, which is another term for pathology. And uh, she used these, uh, used them as tools. I saw them. She donated them to the Maryland uh, uh, Office of Chief Medical Examiner because that's um, the location that houses the Harvard Associates, uh, Howard, uh, excuse me, Howard Associates Homicide School. It's a national school for homicide investigators. And to this day, they use those dollhouses as training. Well, I saw them. I said, "Hey, I can do that." Uh, and in the fall of uh, of uh, 1992, uh, we, con we, the university, contracted with a dollhouse company, and we created six uh, dollhouses that um, were uh, uh, used and have been used uh, since that time. Uh, what I'm going to, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to go through those dollhouses, one to show how they are a, a training tool, and uh, also what. Are the learning points uh, for a crime scene investigation. So if I could, I'm going to ask, oh, way ahead, um, Mark is uh, running the slides for me, and uh, we're going to go through them. As I mentioned, there are six slides, uh, and those are the dioramas. They're called dioramas because they're one-room dollhouses, another term, diorama, and uh, they're one in scale. Everything all the evidence that would be in the scene is there in a synthetic way, obviously, except for fingerprints. In a one-inch scale, the fingerprints would be too small to, to realistically uh, um, analyze. But everything else is there, blood spatter, or biological fluids, uh, whatever uh, might be there, are there. There are six of them. The first one is a, is a convenience store, then a living room, a garage, a kitchen, a dormitory room, 
in the hotel room. We're going to go through each one of them, and I'd, I'd ask uh, uh, if we go to the first one, Mark. I keep shutting, uh, muting my mic because um, I'm constantly coughing, and I apologize for that. Okay, this is a uh, uh, what we call the store, uh, our convenience store. You can't see it too well, but up uh, on the top of your screen, uh, you can't see it, but it actually says 7-Eleven. Um, we originally called it a 7-Eleven store, and then uh, when we ultimately published this book, uh, we decided that uh, we didn't want to have any difficulties with the 7-Eleven uh, people. So we, act in the actual book, The Dollhouse Murders, we, we are, you don't even see those. Anyways, so this is a crime scene. Now, uh, the scenario is simple. Somebody came into the store. This is what they found. They immediately went to a, uh, a telephone uh, and, and called uh, 911. And within 10 minutes... Uh, the police respond, and this is what they see. Now, when the police in the when the police respond to a crime scene, it's usually a uniform officer, and it's his or her responsibility when they determine that they have a crime to declare it a crime scene. By declaring it a crime scene, you mean you want to stop time, you want to literally control the location. You need to determine how much of the location is actually a crime scene. So lots of times on television, you'll see the uh, crime scene tape. <coughs> Excuse me. You'll see the crime scene tape that's out there that's establishing the boundaries. Okay. Um, and the uniform officers, their only job is to ensure that if there's anybody there injured in any way, to find out whether they can help them. If they appear to be possibly expired, dead, then they need to determine that. Um, obviously, they'll call out, call ambulances and EMTs. Um, so the first job is to, uh, to is to aid the injured. When the injured appeared to be deceased, then they they, uh, they establish the crime scene. If they're still alive, then although we ask everybody to try to protect the scene as best as possible, but the focus is on keeping um, victims alive. But in this case here, we have two victims, and they're both very much dead. So the job of the uniform officer is to stop time. Uh, if there are any witnesses at the scene, don't let them leave, because I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, witnesses tend to like to see blood and guts, but as soon as the police turn around to them to ask them questions, they want to leave and they don't want to get involved. So that's one of the jobs of the uniform officers, to who's at the scene and try to identify them. And you can't physically hold them, so if they want to leave, it's important to at least get their names. And in a case like this, you have two dead bodies, confirmed death investigation. Uh, what's important to do at this point is call investigators. The investigators will come, and then it's the investigator who will say, okay, we have, two, we have an unexpected or unusual death. Anytime you have deaths that are unusual, uh, unexpected, unattended, uh, then the investigator will call the medical examiner's office. The medical examiner will listen to the facts over the phone and say, yes, um, we declare this a medical examiner case, which means they're going to respond and they're going to send somebody that is called a forensic investigator. So when you hear the term a forensic investigator, that's the person who represents the medical examiner's office. Generally, the pathologist who actually do the, the autopsy the following day is not coming to the crime scene. That doesn't happen very often. Maybe in small towns that might happen, but generally it doesn't. So the job of the, of the forensic investigator is to examine the bodies, uh, help determine the, um, the, the manner of death. Manner of death is homicide, suicide, accidental, natural, or undetermined. Ultimately, that decision will be made by a doctor after the autopsy. But they have to give information to the police to say, hey, is this suspicious? Uh, is this, does this fall into a criminal death? If at some point, so all unexpected, unusual, unattended deaths will always be considered a homicide until proven otherwise. 
in this case, it's pretty obvious that we got a homicide. So let's let's look at what the forensic investigator and the police um, uh, are looking at. Okay, we have a a person with a mask on who appears to be the, and I say this appears to be somebody who robbed the store. We have money all over the floor. He's got a shotgun uh, inside his coat. Uh, he's dead. Um, we also have a, uh, over here we can see a, a semi-automatic weapon next to the proprietor in the back who's dead. So, and over here near his foot, you can't see it, there's a little red thing. That is a discharge shell from a shotgun. And this is a shotgun that this person has. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, right here, uh, to the left of, of the, um, the body um, closest to you, you have a, a hole in the glass, we have a hole in the back, and inside here, you, you oh, it's over here, is actually a projectile. So, uh, looking at the projectile, uh, we would see that that's a 9 millimeter, which is consistent with the handgun that we found in the floor. So, we have one, obviously, that missed the suspect, and went through here. Next. Okay. Now, uh, when we take a closer look at, at the uh, person, again, we can see where the shotgun is. Go ahead. All right. There's the shot that, the first shot that went into the glass. Next one. Okay. It appears in the, in the medical, uh, the forensic investigator, um, won't be able to tell this conclusively, but it appears that he's been shot in the back, and then one more time, uh, Mark, and he's been shot in the front. So at some point in time, this guy may have been, he grabbed the money, he's running out the front door, and then the guy behind the counter starts shooting, and this guy, even though he got shot in the back, he was able to turn around, bring up the shotgun, and then um, you see what happened. Uh, over here, again, the shotgun only got hit one, uh, sh shot once. And when we look at that ammunition, we see that it's, that's called double lock buck. Double lock buck ammunition, for those uh, uh, viewers who may not know, shoots nine thirty-two caliber balls at the same time. Uh, law enforcement uh, officers who carry shotguns in their cars usually use that kind of ammunition. So you fire it. And in a cone-shaped manner, you have nine balls going out, and obviously the farther away the target is, the wider uh, that goes. Next slide. Okay. Now let's look at the uh, proprietor. Um, here's the gun we can see over here. Right now we don't know where that gun came from, but we find out later on that the owner of the store this this uh, gentleman's uncle left uh, the the gun there in case something like this happened, which was probably to his dismay because if the gun wasn't there, he'd probably still be alive today, and the guy would have ran off, and that was it. But he had tr he tried to save the day. If you look at the blood spatter up here, you can actually see uh, where we believe his head was. Okay, go to the next slide. Okay, so that kind of shows where he probably got shot. In fact, if you if we count the wounds in his head, on the wall, and in the clock, they total nine. I know that because I personally put those nine holes there. Okay, next. That's the gun. Go to that next one. Okay, so, you know, this is not a difficult case, but it's about the students looking, deciding, what needs to be done, um, you know, what's the manner of death. Thing right here to the right. By the way, gentlemen, are you seeing my arrow when I do that? When I, when I make circles, uh, are, you, are you seeing anything? No. no. Probably not. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Mark, just use your arrow to show the, the camera there. There's a camera up there that looks like a surveillance camera, and of course, for this situation, it wasn't working. That's not surprising. Uh, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. 
in fact, you can actually buy fake cameras that, in fact, you know, you can go and buy, you know, for like $29, you can get a, you can mount a camera that even lights up with batteries, and it looks like you got a surveillance camera. If that causes somebody not to rob you, I guess it's worth it, but I don't know. I, I think it's worth the money to have a surveillance camera there. By the time they they try to cut, uh, do anything about it, you probably got a good picture. And as you know, uh, with the uh, Boston bombing, that became great. So, um, so the idea of this for the students is to look at the ammunition, uh, try to reconstruct what you believe happened. Everybody was here. We believe that everybody was here during this crime are dead now. There might have been a third person who ran off. We don't know. There might have been a, another. Uh, customer in here that didn't uh, that just left and we don't know that right now we don't believe that be the case so one of the things the investigators need to do is ensure that no one else witnessed this if we can't find anybody then we have to look at the physical evidence at the scene and try to reconstruct the crime so we can establish what evidence identifies with the victim the suspects in the crime now, is this a case where the only defendant is dead, so we don't have to worry about it? Or later on, we may find that there was a getaway uh, guy outside who, when the guns went off, he just took off. And we may find that out later. So how do you, how do you connect somebody in a car, in a getaway car, with the crime scene? Things to be considered. Maybe fingerprints on the shotgun that belonged to him. Something. Okay. Uh, anybody have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, what are those little dinguses next to them on the shelf? The little white things. Because when I was, uh, this is the one my group did, and uh, we got stuck on. Oh, wait, what? We didn't know what those were. And the pizza. We were focused on the pizza. Well, well, it seemed like a romantic dinner because we thought well, those were candles. Let me just say no. First of all, the two white things were supposed to be the sugar and creamer for the coffee they were selling. <laughs> oh, okay. Don't laugh, okay? <laughs> and the pizza, they were selling pizza. You know, again, when you... Yeah, but it was, you know, okay. was sitting there open. We thought maybe, you know, there was a... I thought there was another person. Well, that's a good That's a good thought. That's so a good a friend, thought. Unless I, the cashier was eating some pizza on the job. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's okay. No, okay. Gonna, All right. Thought. Is, anything else? No. <laughs> By the way, uh, um, both of these uh, folks, uh, Tim and Mark... Um, as students of my class uh, did these exercises, uh, so they're certainly aware of, of how this thing works out. All right, let's go to the next one. Okay, this is cool. This is a living room. It's a detached home, and obviously we have somebody we believe is dead uh, because um, you can't see it too well right now, but uh, in the underside of the body, um, there's a purplish reddish color um, staining of the skin caused by lividity. Lividity is when after a, bird, a body dies, their blood settles to the lower dependent parts of the body and eventually stains the skin. And we'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. Anyways, what we have here is a paper boy who came to deliver the paper to this gentleman. And because he was an older man, um, he always came up to the door and delivered the paper. Those of you who are lucky enough to have somebody deliver the paper to your house, you know you're lucky if it even gets on your property, never mind up to the door. <laughs> but this particular scenario said that he always did this because the old man couldn't walk very well. He goes up to the door, finds the door ajar, looks in, sees Mr. Floyd Henderson um, dead, immediately calls the police, and uh, this is what we found. So... Um, when we start looking at the crime scene again, we have a dead body. Um, you know, it's interesting. When the students, the student team works this, I always tell them, make sure you get the answers to who, what, where, when, why, and how. Because, by the way, at the end of this process, the student group has to give a presentation to the, to the rest of the class. And you wouldn't believe how many times they never ask the name of the body, the person dead. <laughs> the very, I mean, you got to, the focus of your crime scene is the body, and they never said, oh, by the way, what's his name? They never, do, they, they miss that all the time. I don't know why. Anyways, let's look at our crime scene. Next slide. 
Okay, and by the way, Mark, when you know that I've kind of stopped, you can go right to the next slide. You don't have to wait for me. Okay, yeah. uh, this is the back. Uh, well, actually, it's the front of the house. And when we look at it, we uh, we see some footprints uh, there. Uh, and they, they first face the window. So that would give us an indication that maybe whoever broke into this house tried to get through the window. So what what's important about that? Uh, Mark, Tim, why do we care? that they possibly may have tried to get in the window. <laughs> trace evidence. What kind of trace evidence? Uh, fibers, fingerprints. Absolutely. Anything. Especially fingerprints. If yeah. they grab and put their hands on that glass to push up the window, right. uh, great fingerprints. And has, you know, I remember when we the first year that we did the actual house, I had one of my actors with jeans climb in the kitchen window and scrape his jeans on the edge of the, of the bricks. Well, the next day when the students came to process the crime scene, it was pouring all night and all day. I assumed, because the rain was pouring on the windowsill, that the fibers that we placed there the night before wouldn't have been there. But wouldn't you know, the students found fibers consistent with those jeans. They were still there. <laughs> yep. Assume that something's not there because of the weather, whatever the case may be. Okay, so we got trace evidence, possible fingerprints, shoe prints, obviously impression evidence. Uh, if we ever identify a suspect to, sh to prove that he or she was at that location. Okay, next slide. Mm -hmm. So it looks like they walked over to the door, and then the door has been forcibly opened. Next slide, Mark. Thank you. So we see that the door um, has been forcibly opened. We've got some tools left behind uh, that appear to be tools that you would use to break in the door. So uh, we want to we want to use those now. You might say, okay, so big deal. We proved that these two tools broke in the door. How does that help us with identifying the suspect? Again, fingerprints. If we identify a suspect and then we can place their fingerprints on these tools, how do they respond to that? All right. So very mm -hmm. important. There's always a nexus between physical evidence and the victim suspect in the crime. Okay. So, okay. So what do we think we have here? Well, there's a, uh, if we look at the slide on the right hand, it looks like that they were trying to steal items of value. They were putting them in a, in a uh, pillowcase. Uh, there's a lot of blood there. Um, and uh, so we initially have a burglary. Next slide. But the, the burglary seems to have gone awry. Now, no. now, maybe they came in here to burglarize and kill Mr. Henderson. But through investigation, we see that Mr. Hendon, Henderson was sleeping. It appeared he was sleeping in his bed. Uh, he may have heard noise and came out. Now, what we're showing here is the lividity. And the white spots that you see are called pressure points. That's the parts of the body that were laying on the floor. What happens is the weight of the body pushes down on the floor. And when, when the, body, the heart stops beating and the blood is pushed down by gravity, it pulls around the pressure points. So we see a blanched area around these points. Now, we start seeing the staining of the skin anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour after death, depending on the circumstances, what the person was doing beforehand, the environment that it's in. There's a lot of things that affect it. But eventually, the lividity becomes fixated. And that takes anywhere from 6 to 8, sometimes 12 hours. Fixated meaning if you move the body, those pressure points are going to stay just the way they are. So if you ever heard it, uh, on the news, please find a body out in the woods, determine that the body did not was not killed there, that it was killed someplace and moved to that location. If you're wondering how they knew that, one of the ways would have been possibly looking at the lividity. If the body, uh, the positioning of the body is inconsistent 
with uh, the, the, the lividity in the pressure points, then that at least they know that the body was in a different position and stayed there long enough for the lividity to be fixated. Now, in this case, we have fixated lividity. During the investigation, they find out that somebody saw Mr. Henderson alive 8 o'clock the night before. At uh, what time was it? I think it was uh, 7.30 in the morning or 6.30. I think 6.30 in the morning, the paper boy finds him dead. So we know he was awake at 8 o'clock the night before. We know he's dead at 6.30 in the morning, the next morning. We know the lividity is fixated. That brings us back anywhere from around 6 to 12 hours. So we kind of know that we know that he didn't die in the early in the uh, in the in, in the morning. You know, it was close. It's probably closer to midnight, uh, and even closer to eight o'clock. Um, so there is no exact time of death. It doesn't exist. Uh, even though in a, in a little while, Mark's going to talk about one of our uh, uh, one of the uh, stories that we have in the blog about another way to determine that. But there's no real good way. Okay, um, the next slide. Uh, now this, and hit the next uh, button. Okay, right here there's a gash on his head. Many times the students miss this. They see that the, uh, that the lamp has blood on it, the shade has been broken, so right away they assume that the, Mr. Henderson got hit in the head with, the, with the, uh, the, the shade of the lamp. They never bother to look underneath the lamp, and if you can see, there's blood under the base of the lamp, and that the blood is consistent with the trauma on his head and in the shape. So that gives us an indication that he, uh, he was hit in the head. Now go to the next slide. Okay. Um, if you look at this slide, the, the shade is broken, and then there's blood on the shade, there's blood around the shade going to the left, towards the door, and there's a lot of blood, not only on the floor, but on the, do on the doorknob and out the door. The blood um, at Mr. Henderson's head, there's no blood between his head and the end of the, uh, of the lamp, so that would give you an indication that, that he was hit at that location and went down. Now we're going to take samples of all the blood spots to see if the blood in the other areas are different than the blood that belongs to Mr. Henderson. And that would be the case, because I wrote the scenario, that all the other blood belongs to one person, so at least we identify that there's at least one person involved who obviously got away. Okay, let's go to the next one. We're going to work a little bit faster here. Um, this is an interesting case because it's a real case. The other ones I kind of made up, but this is an excellent case. This is a garage in a, in a detached home. The engine is running. Um, the, the keys are locked in the car. The door is down, electric door is down. The family dog is dead. And the woman who lives in the house in her nightgown is dead. Next slide. Okay, so when we look a little bit closer, we find and we turn her over. One, we see lividity. Now, I didn't mention about not only does lividity give us some indication of time and position of death, it also gives us an indication of possible cause of death. Now, this is what we call cherry red lividity. Cherry red lividity is indicative to carbon monoxide poisoning which makes sense here. The engine's running, um, you know, so the garage has been full with carbon monoxide. Um, now, the key is, okay, what's the manner of death? Did somebody kill her? Did, did she commit suicide? You know, did she just bring the car in, start the engine, and just lay there? And uh, But why is all this brown stuff on her nightgown? Her nightgown is full of dog feces, all right? Now, if she committed suicide, we wouldn't see that. If you look at her shoe, one of her two shoes has uh, dog feces on it. That gives an indication that she may have slipped when she got out of the car. Why 
she left the engine running, we don't know. Okay. Bottom line is, at the scene, because this was a real case, and I watched this woman be an autopsy the following day. At the scene, the forensic investigator determined that the manner of death was undetermined. He wasn't sure. Now, there is a gash on her head, and there's some uh, blood. I think if you hit the, yeah, right there, I think if you hit the next button, I think you're going to see circles around. Uh, one more. Okay, there's the, that, there was blood on the end of the toolbox, and there is a gash in her head. So, at the, at, at the crime scene, at the scene, they believed that she must have gone out, somehow slipped, hit her head, and was unconscious. She was breathing the carbon monoxide. She dies. Well, that was good, and the being undetermined was okay. By the way, her husband found her. Um, there was no information that uh, that she would have committed suicide. She never tried before. By the way, people who are successful in committing suicide more times than not try before uh, before they're successful. Anyways. Um, the next day, <coughs> excuse me. Next day, when they they autopsied her and opened her her head, um, they determined that she was not unconscious. They could tell because there was no seepage of blood in the cavity uh, inside the skull. So the doc, the pathologist turned to me and said, well, she wasn't unconscious because we would have seen seepage of blood here. So it appears that she hit her head, was stunned, tried to get up. That's why the dog feces all over her nightgown. And she just just laid there, I guess, for a while, long enough to be overcome by the carbon monoxide. So it was ended up, it ended up to be determined an accident, no further investigation required by the police. Okay, uh, why don't I stop for a second so I can drink some more water. And Mark, why don't you uh, uh, do the forensic IQ for us, would you? All right, great. Let me get this uh, screen share back up. There we go. All right, so we, this week we have quite a few up there. I think there was five, if I counted correctly. Uh, first one, for all you smartphone users out there, uh, Snapchat is a new and very popular smartphone application. Uh, a lot of people use it. A lot of people, it's pretty much the basic, if you don't know what it is, you take a picture, you send it to your friend, they only have about 10 seconds to view it, and then according to the people who use it, they believe that the photo just disappears. Um, apparently, a firm based out of Orem, Utah, called Decipher Forensics, actually has been able to extract these photos um, and stating that the photos have never actually been fully deleted off of the phone. So be careful what you Snapchat with your friends. Um, more on that article up on the blog. Uh, the next one that we have up here, let's see, uh, the scene will dictate what you need from the suspect. Uh, pretty much just exactly what we're talking about uh, with the dollhouse murders. Um, the first thing that investigators go to is the scene. They they figure out what they what they can figure out from the scene. Uh, if they need to get fingerprints from the scene, they collect fingerprints from the scene, and they compare them to the suspect's fingerprints when they have them in custody. Um, also, fingerprints it works well with other trace evidence as well, like we were talking about the the uh, cut off from the genes. Compare that to the suspect's genes. You have a match. It's pretty much clear cut right there. Uh, more on that on the blog. Let me let me mention something. Uh, what Mark is saying is that when he says that the crime scene will dictate what you need to identify the suspect, if you're trying to establish a nexus between the suspect and the crime scene, you need to make sure that that evidence that puts him at the crime scene is not something that should be there anyways. For example, there's something called innocent access evidence. If the suspect had a right to be at the crime scene prior to the crime, uh, for whatever reason, finding his fingerprints there in itself isn't helpful. Okay? So you need to make sure that the evidence that places him at the crime scene um, 
is evidence that associates with the crime and isn't innocent access. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly right. Uh, more on that on the blog. Another one up there on the blog is uh, forensic utilized in animal abuse crackdown. Uh, different parts of our country are swamped with different types of animal abuse. Uh, Florida has cockfighting, the Carolinas have puppy mills, and Madison County actually has a cat sanctuary which contains somewhere close to 700 cats, which is unbelievable. <laughs> um, and this goes through, uh, a couple weeks ago we had Gary Pusillo on the show and we're hopefully getting him, or we are getting him in the next couple weeks, so hopefully he can come and comment more about this. Uh, the ASPCA, which is the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, actually deals with a lot of these cases and helps law enforcement agencies put together cases uh, which can hold up in court. Uh, more on that on the blog. And let's see, I think we have one, one or two more, I think. Um, Another one, another person who is possibly tied to the Boston investigations for the Boston bombings uh, is a 27-year-old ch with Chechen roots and also mixed martial arts background that mirrors that of one of the Boston bombing suspects, was actually fatally shot by authorities early Wednesday, this past Wednesday, at, in his Orlando home after a meeting with an FBI agent and two Massachusetts state troopers. Uh, apparently it was a meeting because they were trying to figure out if he was connected to the Boston bombings and they actually established that connection after uh, the uh, altercation that occurred. Uh, more on that on the blog. And the last one up there real quick, uh, estimating time of death by circadian rhythm. Uh, researchers have actually found that they can estimate a healthy person, a healthy brain, person's time of death with an accuracy to within a few hours just by analyzing the activity levels of a set of genes within certain regions of their brain. Mark, that's, um, a, bunch of, Mark, that's a bunch of crap. I mean, I'm sure that might be true, but I, <laughs> I, I, but if you keep on reading the article, you know, it says, well, there are all these you know, these things. Uh, that I, I think somebody had to do their dissertation and had to come up with something, and that's where they did this research. That's what they did. I mean, I'm glad you put it up there, just to, you know, because it's up there, but let me just say to you, that is not something that's going to happen. In fact, it says, well, we can get within a, an hour or two of the time of death. Right. Well, we can get into a, an hour or two generally now with what we know. With other things. With other things. So, okay. Right. With more accuracy, I bet. Right. So, Mark, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate that. Uh, before we go, um, get back to uh, the dollhouse, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the dollhouses as a training aid. Um, several professors and uh, colleagues of mine uh, have told me in, in the country that they're actually using this book um, as a means to uh, uh, to teach uh, the uh, uh, the curriculum of, of crime scene investigation. And I'm excited um, to hear that uh, the, uh, the the actual dollhouse is only there's only one set, and obviously they use it here. Uh, in the summer, University of Maryland Dr. Cassie Thompson from the University of Maryland has been teaching for many years a two-week school for high school teachers in forensics, and she borrows three of my six dollhouses and she has for a long time and um, the Howard Hughes Institute of something that that uh, I think uh, funds her program uh, did an article about the dollhouses and um, Jessica uh, Sachs who's an author who uh, wrote the book called Corpse uh, Nature Forensics in the Struggle to Pinpoint Time of Death and um, there it is. Thank you. Um, Tim is putting it up for you. Great book. Um, and Jessica called me up and said, hey, uh, I write for Popular Science Magazine, uh, and uh, I'd like to do a story on the dollhouses. And so she wrote the story, and I got a call from uh, the editor of Popular Science Magazine and said, we're Popular Science Magazine. Why are we writing a story about dollhouses? Why aren't you using, uh, you know, software and virtual crime uh, crime scenes and all that kind of stuff? I said, well, because they're two-dimensional. My dollhouses are three-dimensional. And I talked about the fact that the students can sit around them, even though they're a one-inch scale. I truly believe when the student, when you watch the students working on the crime scene, even though it's a one-inch scale uh, diorama, 
I think they forget that's what they're looking at, and they're inside that crime scene. And I've been very impressed on on how they deal with it, asking questions. So it's been very effective. Anyways, after I had that conversation with the editor, um, they eventually uh, did the story. And um, not too long after the story uh, came out, I know you can't see this, but uh, that's the story. Anyways, um, after it came out, then um, per Pearson uh, Publications called me up, and they said, hey, we want to write a book called The Dollhouse Mur Murders based on your dollhouses. And I said, uh, I don't think so. I'm a little busy right now. They said, oh, no. You've already done the writing. You've got the scenarios. We can help you. We'll get it together. Anyways, uh, we did it, and uh, that's the story about the dollhouse murders. So what we did is we kind of uh, we put uh, meat to the bones. You know, the, uh, the, the bones was the, the basic scenario. We didn't have to get into a long, extravagant, um, detailed story, but uh, we did that in the book. So uh, I'm glad to hear that there's people out there still using the book, and uh, um, and I think there it's it's a great way to that to, uh, to to give students the ability to take what they learned all semester because this is the last exercise we do in my course. So they're learning about the various types of evidence. They're learning about the you know, the steps of a crime scene, what's important and why, and what you learn from it. Then they do this exercise and they have to put it all together. Rather than have all this information in these stovepiped things, they need to now cross over the stovepipes and understand the various things. And if they miss something, I think uh, uh, both Mark and, and Tim watched their classes. For example, if they miss understanding the lividity, um, you know that the uh, the color of cherry red lividity means carbon monoxide poisoning, then they're going to miss a, an important factor in the in the crime scene. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's been uh, very very effective, and uh, that's why we thought we'd uh, talk about it today. Let's go go through at least one or two more, um, Mark, if you don't mind. All right. Yeah. Okay. This is now when we when you hear the term death investigation, don't assume that a death investigation is a crime. Any unattended death or unusual circumstance death, in other words, a person's healthy and now they're dead, um, uh, requires what we call a death investigation. Now, during the course of a death investigation, you may find out that, hey, this person died of natural causes or by way of an accident or something, and there's no crime, um, there's no, you know, no suspect to look for. And when that time comes, then the plot, uh, the police can stop. The problem is, if they don't assume the worst at the beginning, if they don't declare, okay, we have an unattended, unexpected death. If they don't declare it a crime scene for purposes of protecting information and evidence, later on, if they find out it truly is a crime, then they may lose a lot of valuable evidence. Now, some people say, wait a minute now, why do you want them to treat the scene as a crime when it's obviously not? Well, nothing's obvious. Right? And if at, the, at some point in time during the crime scene investigation, if it's determined that this is truly an accident or natural, then just stop. You don't stop doing the crime scene processing. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, nothing lost. Okay. Anyways, this is a, a case. And very quickly, um, uh, this woman, uh, Hazel Washington, uh, um, was uh, her daughter was trying to get her at 9.30 in the morning. Uh, the phone was busy. She called all day long because she lives out of town. Eventually that night, she got nervous, called up the police to please come in, and they see Mrs. Uh, Hazel Washington dead on the floor. She has a gash to her head. The lividity on her body is a dark purple. Now, for those of you who are not my students who may not know, dark purple is indicative to some type of asphyxia, some loss of oxygen. You might have a dark purple if you've been choked to death, if you were hung, or if you just choked on food. Now here, we're, go back to that again. Uh, 
here at the scene we have some blood on the on the end uh, end of the uh, kitchen counter we have a syringe in a bottle we find out that it's uh, it's insulin she's a uh, diabetic so that's all that is it's not anything else than that <coughs> she has hit her head but the lividity is dark purple uh, that's not a very good photograph but trust me it's dark purple so the question for the forensic investigator and the police at the scene and the evidence technician is what caused her to lose oxygen? And if you look around the scene, if you're a viewer right now and this is the first time you've seen the scene, uh, it might be hard for you to see that, but it looks like at some point in time she was eating breakfast. There's eggs on the, in a frying pan on the stove on the table there's toast she has taken two bites out of each piece of toast that's today's newspaper so the, the paper has been delivered to the house she lives alone make a long story short in the interest of time because I see we only have 10 minutes left is she choked on the toast she jumped up the seat went on the chair went back it looks like she appeared she tried to dial 911 she got to the phone but she never got the dial she comes back, hits her head, and she loses oxygen to a point where she dies. Now, forensic investigator and investigators who see that pur dark purple lividity right at the scene, you don't have to wait till the next day of the autopsy. You say, hey, we need to be looking for something that would have caused that to happen. Now, you're not going to see any food stuck in her throat because that's not going to be found to the next day, but at least you have an indicator of a possibility. Because again, you're trying to reconstruct what happened based on what you have on the scene. Mm -hmm. Now, it isn't guessing to some extent you are, and obviously the more experience you have, the better your guessers are, but I don't like the word guess, and you certainly wouldn't use that uh, in a courtroom uh, testifying. But you can use terminology like, it appears that it, I believe that based on what we see that this this and this happened and if there's no evidence to contradict that then and you can go along with it and that's how you create your investigation okay let's go to the uh, we're going to skip over the um, the uh, dormitory one let's go because that uh, that that has a lot to discuss. Uh, in fact, some night, in fact, you know what we're going to do next week when we have the forensic nurses in? We mm -hmm. might bring the, use this dollhouse uh, because this is a date rape case. So we might use that as an experience. Mm -hmm. That would be good. What do you think, uh, Tim? Yeah, yeah that, sounds that, like might a good be good, that might be a good idea. Okay, so let's go to the next one, the last one. This is a hotel. We have a woman who um, who's on business. Uh, she's dead. Uh, she's been uh, sh uh, appears that she's been shot. There's a uh, 38 caliber uh, revolver uh, on her bed. You can go to the next one. Um, hit the button twice. You're going to hear the gun go off. Okay. So she first uh, there's a there's a bullet lodged in the wall and there's a bullet um, in her head. Uh, that right hand circle shows. That's called a tattoo pattern. That is that black uh, residue is the residue that comes out of the gun from unburnt powders, etc. Looking at the, uh, the diameter of that tattoo pattern can give us some indication of how far away the muzzle of the gun was. Now you see that her arm is up in the air. I mean, just stuck up there. And what is that? That is called a cadaveric spasm. It's called instantaneous rigor mortis. Now, when we examine this body, we find that the rest of her body is not stiff. There's no rigor mortis in the rest of her body, but her arm is stiff up in that position. This is really interesting. A cadaveric spasm is caused when you, it's a psychological anxiety experience just prior to death. When you see death coming, your sympathetic nervous system kicks in and tries to help you defend it. And what's the normal thing when you see somebody coming at you with a gun or a knife or whatever? You kind of want to go like this. 
And in this case, she probably went up like this. The gun went off. She died instantly. And because of the traumatic event that she experienced psychologically and uh, physically in her, her, her sympathetic nervous system, her arm became immediately stiff. So the, we see that the rest of her body hasn't caught up yet to her arm. Eventually, the rest of her body will be caught, it will, uh, will be stiff. But in this case, we're there, the police are there, go to the next slide, we're there minutes after somebody said they heard the gunshots. So this is the scene, uh, the, the toilet seat is up, urine in there, indication there's a man that may have urinated, you want to get that for DNA. The volume is a prescription uh, owned by the victim. There's a bottle of wine in, in our champagne that's been uh, with, with partially melted ice. Uh, both of the glasses have been poured. So right away we assume that, um, that uh, room service was called. Next one. Uh, one of the questions I always ask the students is, do you believe that she knew her attacker? And right away they always say, oh yeah. And I say, why? Well, because they were drinking wine together. Well, you don't know that. But bottom line is, um, she did not call for room service, but the suspect made it look like he was room service, even though she didn't. She didn't um, ask for room service, and she knew that. She opened the door. He came in, the gun. He raped her, sodomized her. Um, what we have here is the students have put a black light on the the scene. And you can see indications of biological fluids, probably semen, possibly. Uh, we have it in both uh, cavities of the body. So uh, we have two kinds of crimes, uh, rape and sodomy, which are two separate offenses. So that's evidence that we want to collect. Go to the next slide. We find that her checkbook is still there, her wallet and her money is still in there. So. She didn't get robbed. So, uh, what's the circumstance? Bottom line is this guy saw her at the restaurant alone and thought that he could get her to engage in, uh, in a tryst uh, and, and, and want, to, want to do that. She, she uh, you know, obviously let, her, let him do what he did, but at some point in time, she probably tried to, when he put the gun down, he probably, she probably tried to grab the gun, and they fought over the gun, and it went off. Um, interesting, this, uh, one of my students several years ago said, I think she knew him, because look at all the provocative clothing in her, in her uh, suitcase. Mm -hmm. If you look at the suitcase, she's got you know, you know, uh, sexy uh, nightgowns and stuff like that. Well, that was my fault. Because when I had the dollhouse company build the dollhouse, all I said was, I need a suitcase in there with women's clothes that she would use. I didn't, I wasn't specific, and but that was a good observation by one of the students. And that was made, that's been made several times over the years. Okay. All right, we're going to stop now because I only have two minutes and I want to run um, back to, uh, to tell you what, what's going on in the next uh, several weeks. Next week, next Thursday, episode uh, 25, we are very fortunate to have four members of the International Association of Forensic Nursing. Forensic nursing is a relatively new uh, area of expertise, and it's important for all you to know what they do. Uh, um, they're involved in a number of different things. Specifically, they're involved in doing the medical legal examination of rape victims in hospitals. But we're going to learn of all the other things that they do. The International Association of Forensic Nursing happens to be right here in Elk Ridge, Maryland. And uh, I met them at the American Academy of Forensic Sciences conference this year. So they're going to be here. June 6th, we have Dr. Gary Pazillo, the uh, forensic animal nutritionist. He's coming back. For those of you who might, uh, might have tried to um, watch episode 20. It was a, I got to tell you, it was a great show. Problem, his audio, for some reason, his audio did not record. We could hear him during the, uh, during the show, but it didn't record. We're going to do it over again. It's a great show. 
Uh, June 13, Dr. Arnett, or uh, commonly known as Pat, Dr. Pat Gaston, a clinical psychologist who's been on a show before. He's not only a clinical psychologist and a colleague of mine, but he's also a forensic hypnotist like I am. And we're going to talk about forensic hypnosis and how we use hypnosis to help retrieve information from victims and witnesses of crime who have lost it because of the traumatic event of experiencing it. So that's June 13th. One more guest I want to tell you about. We have Maryland State Police Lieutenant Retired David Reichenbach, um, who is was the Operations Commander and Criminal Intelligence Division um, uh, Commander um, back uh, in 2002 during the Washington sniper case. He was the one that physically pulled the two snipers out of the car on uh, Interstate 95. Excited. Uh -huh. Um, about hearing him, and I'm um, being told that uh, it is 8 o'clock, so uh, we'll let you know what date uh, that happened. So uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Tim and Mark. Uh, Mark did a great job with the slides. Appreciate it. Tim, yeah. uh, thank you for uh, for being a uh, producer. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, meanwhile, uh, please uh, continue to tell your friends and colleagues um, we really believe that we're going to have some great shows coming up in the in the weeks to come, and we're going to have some new people involved with the show um, that uh, will make it even better. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed tonight's show. Uh, see you next week. Uh, make sure that you come and uh, visit uh, the other uh, shows that are archived on ForensicWeek.com. Have a safe day, and have a great weekend. We have a Memorial Day weekend, so I hope you have a good weekend and see you next